So, uh, hello everybody, welcome back on uh, Slevarna stage. Uh, we know that uh, competition right now is very hard, but uh, Josef will be the best presenter you definitely uh, seen today, maybe tomorrow and next few months also. Uh, I'm very proud that I can uh, invite to stage uh, Josef Tietek, who is uh, for a long time with the parallel community as a, as a member of Parallel Nipolis Club. He's also, he very early found out about the Bitcoin and he, uh, but from 2015 he said he is very much involved. He works as a developer for uh, our cooperative with uh, Top Monks and also he's working on the project of Dbank and uh, right now he's ready for his presentation about Bitcoin. Also, I have to say that he's, uh, he's one who is helping us with the uh, Bitcoin meetups in Paralnipolis, so I'm very thankful to him for this. So, Josef, floor is yours. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, we are going to have some fun uh, analyzing Bitcoin security budget. So, who here, who here has heard about uh, the term security budget in relation to Bitcoin? Okay, just a couple of guys. That's good, because you're actually going to learn something new. All right, so uh, when I was like uh, going through the presentation with my wife, which uh, I highly recommend, because wives are like uh, good, uh, honest critics of, uh, of your work, uh, she said, like, uh, you know, I don't really get it, what you're saying, because it's this crazy Bitcoin stuff. But uh, maybe at the first, uh, at the beginning, you should say, like, uh, why are you talking about it? So, so the motivation for the talk is uh, that this idea that Bitcoin is like a low transaction fee payment system, this needs to be destroyed. And uh, the comparison, for example, to Visa on a transaction per second basis is uh, really stupid because Bitcoin was never meant to be that and Bitcoin was never designed that way. Uh, we can have like other comparisons with Visa but on uh, like a volume basis, not on like a transaction count. And uh, the basic inspiration for the talk uh, are the works of uh, great Bitcoin analysts uh, Dan Held, Nick Carter, Paul Stortz and Hasu. Uh, and my talk is actually like a synthesis of their talks uh, and trying to like uh, move their ideas a little bit further and uh, derive uh, something new. So, uh, what's, what is actually a security budget? Security budget is uh, like the sum of payments that we pay for Bitcoin miners in order uh, to secure uh, the immutability and irreversibility of our transactions. Uh, security budget is also called like mining rewards and mining rewards consist of block subsidies and transaction fees. And uh, as I've been learning about Bitcoin over the years, it's sometimes called like uh, going down the rabbit hole of uh, learning about Bitcoin. I found that um, at the bottom of the rabbit hole is actually the security budget. Because uh, if you start thinking about uh, Bitcoin on uh, like uh, the economics of Bitcoin, you find out it all revolves around this uh, measure, around uh, security budget. So uh, if we are going to make some forward looking statements about Bitcoin, I think it sh we should start uh, with uh, analyzing security budget. And there are three basic questions uh, when it comes to security budget. How can we actually know that we are not underpaying miners? That we are not overpaying miners? Or if we know this question for now and for the past, uh, how can we know that we won't do so in the future? Yeah, and uh, you can approach uh, this problem from like uh, uh, two lines of thinking. You can either try to derive uh, the, like something like an adequate security budget from the market cap, as uh, some analysts have tried to do, but uh, that's not really telling us much because uh, market cap itself is uh, like a really meaningless uh, measure. Uh, if you take a look, for example, at uh, UTXOH, you can see that uh, about 4 million Bitcoins haven't moved in uh, more than five years. So actually the market cap may be overstated by 
more than 20% because we don't know if these UTXOs are actually spendable. Uh, a lot of those Bitcoins are lost and uh, market cap uh, just doesn't tell us anything. It's just this uh, stock measure. We need uh, to go for the flow measure because uh, security budget is actually highly relevant to what goes on, what goes on uh, now on a daily basis, not uh, just some big uh, total aggregate. So the second, uh, second line of thinking how we can derive the security budget is by looking at uh, the on-chain transfers, what, get, uh, what gets transacted uh, on-chain for example, on a daily basis, and we are going to analyze that. All right, so let's uh, answer the first question. That's quite easy. How can we know that we don't underpay miners? Well, first of all, uh, Bitcoin is here for 10 years, and uh, as far as we know, we haven't seen a real like a double spend, 51% attack that would try to like inject uh, the alternate history so that somebody would be scammed on the blockchain level. Of course, we had uh, some double spend uh, like uh, with uh, zero confirmation transactions. Uh, that's actually what uh, Charlie Hill is doing here on Hackers Congress with his, uh, with his app and with uh, his workshops. But we didn't, we never saw uh, like a double spent attack on the blockchain itself when some uh, previously mined uh, blocks would be reorked. And uh, we have a nice uh, case study uh, that CZ from Binance um, like provided us uh, this year. Because in May 2019, Binance was hacked and about 7,000 Bitcoins were stolen. That was worth about $40 million back then. And uh, he got this crazy idea. It wasn't actually his idea at first. Uh, I think it was from uh, Jeremy Rubin. He got this idea that uh, he could try to reorg the chain and uh, either get those coins back or just uh, distribute them uh, among the miners so that he would hurt the hacker. Fortunately, he discussed that with his uh, good friend, uh, good old uh, Jihan Wu and others. And he understood that uh, the idea is stupid and uh, it would be hugely uh, costly to do that. All right, so, so we can be quite sure that we don't underpay miners uh, com compared to some altcoins which were actually attacked uh, with the 51% attack. So how can we know that we don't underpay miners? And interesting uh, fact is that uh, Nick Carter, who uh, like uh, did some great analysis of security budget. Uh, I highly recommend uh, this article. It's the Settlement Assurance is Stupid. It's uh, his, uh, his title. Uh, so Nick says, uh, this is actually my view. Due to like this fixed uh, block subsidies and high uh, notional amount of single Bitcoin units, we are probably highly, highly overpaying miners. And I, I will try to like, uh, uh, critique this idea, because I don't think uh, this is so. But let's say uh, Nick's idea, it makes kind of sense at the first glance, because it's true. We have uh, fixed block subsidies. First, we had like 50 Bitcoins per block, 25 Bitcoins, 12.5. That's where we are now. And uh, every four years, this gets halved, right? So. Yeah, we can, we can say miners get 12.5 Bitcoins now. It's true. But as uh, Hasu, other great analytical mind, says, like the token itself, Bitcoin, doesn't have any intrinsic value. It doesn't have any value by itself. The only value is there on like the social layer, which is just a fancy term for the market. So the market decides what uh, is the worth of the Bitcoin that miners get. So, of course, 12.5 Bitcoin in 2016, after the halving, is not the same uh, purchasing power as to 12.5 Bitcoins now. And uh, we can see that on the next chart. This is how much uh, the miners earn uh, on a daily basis, as a daily median in USD all through the history, and uh, it's in a log scale, right? So that it's actually readable. 
Uh, I have uh, put the floor at $10,000 because be before 2011 they didn't really receive much. Uh, it's the total mining rewards, total security budget, so that means it's uh, both the block subsidies and the transaction fees. But the transaction fees actually make up like 2 or 3% of the mining rewards, so it's mostly just uh, block subsidies. And uh, you can see in 2016, after the halving, which was like in Q2, miners got like uh, $2 million daily. And now they still make 12.5 Bitcoin per block, but, oh, sorry, here, uh, they get $20 million. So the same block subsidy trans, uh, translates to uh, hugely different like purchasing power. And you can actually see that even before the halving, miners got like 25 bitcoins per block, let's say, but it was uh, worth much less. So it doesn't actually matter how much bitcoins they get. What matters is like the purchasing power. You don't have to measure it actually in dollars, you can measure it in like uh, cheeseburgers or whatever. But uh, the fact is that bitcoin doesn't exist there as uh, in some vacuum. It's an uh, it's like uh, mm, measured in real world stuff, whether it's dollars or check rounds or beers or whatever. All right, so uh, this chart uh, tells us how much does Bitcoin actually transfer on a daily basis in dollar terms. Uh, it's, it's a median, which I think is a much better measure than averages. And we can see the dynamic is quite similar to the mining rewards. Right, so right now, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain uh, on chain, actually on chain, uh, transfers around two billion dollars daily, and uh, you can see that I have uh, two curves here. I have uh, data from Blockchain.info and Coinmetrics, and they are a little bit similar. Actually, uh, the difference is uh, a multiple of two. Blockchain.info uh, tells us that we. Uh, that uh, Bitcoin transfers $1 billion daily, while Coinmetrics tells us it's $2 billion daily. So, as a side note on like Bitcoin data, uh, and this is quite interesting because uh, there are two things we don't actually accurately know about uh, what goes on in Bitcoin. The first one is, uh, uh, as the world has seen recently, like two weeks ago, we don't actually know what the hash rate is. Right, uh, some, some analysts thought that uh, the hash rate dropped uh, 40% one day because that's what the data showed us. Uh, there was a drop of 40% on one day in the hash rate. But uh, the thing is, we cannot accurately measure the short-term hash rate because uh, it's measured just, uh, it's derived actually uh, from the time difference between each mined blocks. So, to the surprise of many, uh, this hash rate uh, went back up uh, the next day. So there, there actually wasn't any drop in hash rate. It was just uh, just a deviation in how the data is derived. And uh, the same thing applies also to uh, net on-chain transfers. Uh, and this might seem kind of strange because we can see uh, on the blockchain how much bitcoins uh, get uh, transacted, but uh, the raw transactions themselves don't tell us like what the uh, economically significant transfers are because there are a lot of change outputs and there are a lot of like uh, it's called uh, short term hops where uh, a transaction is spent for example after one confirmation which usually happens if somebody does like uh, a lot of transactions from his own wallet and he just mixes it so that's actually what um, that's actually how both blockchain.info and Coinmetrics uh, try to derive like the daily net transfers uh, by subscribe by uh, actually uh, taking out the change outputs or what they think are change, out change outputs because we, we are not actually sure what the change out outputs are and by taking out uh, like these short term hops, right? So. Uh, we don't actually know how much uh, gets transferred on chain in the short term, but in the long term, we can see uh, that it has some trend, right? The same f stuff as with hash rate. Uh, it's a bad measure for the short term, but a good measure for the long term. This like derivation. 
All right, uh, and uh, in the next slide, I'm actually using uh, the coin metrics data because uh, from the perspective of security budget, it's actually more conservative, right? All right, so this is like uh, my attempt to derive something like an adequate security budget. Uh, I measure here the ratio of uh, mining rewards to the daily transfers. So that means what kind of percentage do miners earn when compared to how much gets transferred on a daily basis in the long term, both in uh, like medians. Right, it's not averages, uh, we just uh, measure the medians. And it's kind of interesting. We see that after like uh, the three first years, it uh, dropped heavily, and then it uh, gets kind of flat. And uh, actually, if we measure like uh, the correlation between, between mining rewards and the daily transfers, the correlation is quite big. It's like uh, 0 0.97 for the 10-year period. For uh, the five-year period, it's like 0 0.95. So, so there's quite a big correlation here. All right, uh, this is a zoom of the same metric, rewards to transfers, uh, but just for five years. And why to the recent five years? Because there are three points um, why I think this is like significant and relevant. First of all, in the past five years, uh, like all the metrics have just uh, blown up. Like uh, uh, the price, the volumes, and uh, the adoption, uh, it's just like 100 times uh, larger compared to like 2015. The second point is uh, we have like uh, a professional, uh, like the mining industry got much more professional. Uh, in 2016, I think it was Q1 or Q2, Antminer S9 was introduced, and this was a 17 nanometer miner. And for uh, like next, I think, uh, three or four years, no, sorry, it couldn't be four years, it was for three years, uh, this was the peak of the possible architecture. So that there was no longer like this race of the miners to get uh, the newest uh, ASIC miner and just to mine as much as possible in uh, as short term as possible. And that's why in the first years you got this uh, concentration of hash rate in China because they were the closest to the factories. But uh, that doesn't actually happen anymore uh, after we reached like the peak efficiency with 17 nanometer end miners. Uh, there, there were uh, like seven nanometer end miners introduced, uh, I think, in December 2018. But you can see it doesn't actually change uh, the economics that much anymore, right? Because the mining industry is much more professional and much more competitive. So, what uh, now matters is like uh, the long-term efficiency of the miners when it comes to like uh, operational expenditure. All right, and uh, what you also, like the third points, uh, what you got in these five years is uh, you get the halving here. And you can see after the halving, like uh, the ratio of the rewards to the transfers kind of dropped, but then it got up and it was actually even higher than before uh, the halving uh, after some time. So you can see, you can, I think you can start seeing like the emerging pattern of the underlying uh, Bitcoin economics when it, when it comes to security budget in these five years. And like the average of this ratio over the five year period is 0.8% and the median is 0.7%. And I think this is quite, uh, quite a beautiful number, uh, especially the median, because uh, uh, when we compare it with something, it's uh, kind of mind blowing and I'm going to get there uh, in a few seconds. So let us just help ourselves right now with uh, two, key, two quotes from uh, Dan Held and Nick Carter. So Dan Held uh, points out that the security budget is relevant only actually as a protection to the 51% attack, which happens at the tip of the blockchain, right? Only like uh, for the recent blocks is that relevant. Because 
uh, even at uh, for the altcoins that were 51% attacked, uh, there was no like complete chain rewrite. It was just like last couple of hundred blocks so that uh, they could uh, the attacker could scam the exchange. And what uh, Nick says has something to do with uh, like uh, this professionalization of the mining industry. Because at the time of winning a block, the miner has probably burned resources roughly equivalent to the value of the block uh, with just a small margin. Because the industry is much more competitive and much more professional and uh, there's no longer this race to get the latest ASIC anymore. So the miner has to be incentivized to actually play nice, create valid and rule following blocks and not try to reorg the tip of the blockchain like uh, Dan Held says. All right, so having this in mind, uh, why is actually this number significant? Like uh, the average of the five year period 0.9% and the median 0.7%. Uh, just for the reminder, this is like uh, the ratio of the mining rewards compared with uh, like daily transfers, what get transferred daily on Bitcoin blockchain. So when we take a look at uh, daily blocks, there are 144 blocks per day. And one block out of these 144% of 144 is uh, like uh, the division gets us a result of 0.7%, which, which is the same. Seems nice, but uh, maybe it's just, that's just like uh, random. But I don't think it's actually random because how much value, how, uh, how worth would we expect this one block to be? We would expect it, like a, a typical block, to be worth like 0.7% uh, of the daily transfers, right? If you have like this uh, equal distribution of the value between the blocks daily, you would have this, uh, you would expect that the block is uh, worth this much. Like if uh, 144 million dollars were transferred daily, then one block would be worth uh, one million dollars, right? So now, how is that relevant uh, compared to like uh, mining rewards? We need miners to actually produce valid rule following blocks that are not attacking the network. So it means we have to incentivize the miners to accept the reward and not accept like uh, the reorg yield, right? And the reorg yield or reorg reward would be worth that much. Because if we go for a reward, the maximum reward that the miner get, could get is how much uh, the single block is worth, which uh, on the long term is this number, 0.7%, like the one million dollar, for example. So in order for the miners to play it nice, we need them to have at least, on a long-term basis, the same amount as they would get if they were trying to reorg uh, the blocks. So I think this is like a kind of nice, kind of mind-blowing that we see that uh, the economics of Bitcoin, of the mining rewards, like gets in um, disharmony, right, with what you would expect. All right, so this is, uh, this is like uh, the theory or the trying to explain the, the observed correlation in a nutshell, right? So miner has to be incentivized to not attack uh, the blockchain, to act nicely. What does it mean to be incentivized? It means that the mining reward has to be adequate. It doesn't tell us uh, that much. Uh, what's adequate? Adequate uh, means it should be worth like waiting for the Coinbase maturity to get the reward, which means that the mining reward should be higher or the same as the real reward, right? And uh, like uh, we can see that this 0.7% of daily transfers seems to be the rough rule, uh, rule of thumb for like the adequate security budget. But we can see that uh, actually in the history it was uh, sometimes less than this 0.7%. And I think uh, this is due to like other factors uh, because uh, there, are, there is no pool with 51% hash rate actually. So it will be hard to coordinate uh, as um, CZ uh, found out. 
uh, the miners have, have like huge uh, capex that they need to amortize, uh, amortize and uh, like pay off in the long term. So they have to like play the long term play, not just go for like the individual mining rewards, but to like uh, try to go for the long term mining rewards. But if it would like break down completely and uh, miners would get like 0.001%, uh, as happened actually for the altcoins, uh, it would pay off uh, not to play nice, but to actually reorg. So, uh, if we like accept that this is at least uh, kind of true, at least on the good way to get the true security budget, uh, how can we know that we won't uh, overpay or underpay miners in the future? And Satoshi, like, uh, presumed or anticipated, anticipated these kinds of debates uh, when in 2010 he said um, like in two decades there will either be like a huge volume of uh, transactions and the fees of course or there will be none so we need like big fees in the future right so let's see like uh, where are we right now uh, like the transaction fees uh, they are nowhere like high enough uh, it was looking kind of good in here, 2017. Everybody was pissed off that they have to pay uh, uh, like high transaction fees. But then after SegWit, it kind of broke down. And uh, right now, uh, the transaction fees uh, make up only like 2% of the total security budget. So that, that's, that's not a lot, right? Uh, and in 10, in 10 years, like uh, that's basically the horizon that Satoshi talks about, like after 20 years, since 2010, they are going to be about 97% uh, of all Bitcoins mined. So, to keep uh, the security budget adequate so that it uh, actually sh secures what gets transferred on chain, we need either of two things. We either need like uh, higher transaction fees, like much higher, so that they make up like, for example, 50% of the security budget, or me, we need like a massive rise in price. So you can see, you can ask like how massive? I'm glad somebody asked that. Uh, so I have actually uh, made some uh, scenarios and I have three scenarios here. Right now we uh, see like daily transfers uh, about $2 billion daily, right? Uh, if we reached uh, like visa volumes, Visa transfers about $20 billion daily. So this is the second scenario. And the third one is uh, $200 billion, which seems crazy, but it's only 10% of Fedwire. And Fedwire is uh, something like SWIFT, but for just uh, American banks. It's a settlement system for uh, settling uh, like transactions uh, among uh, in the American banking system. And they do actually $2 trillion daily. So if we just reach 10% of that, it would be $200 billion. All right, so what are the other variables? Uh, we get this adequate mining reward of 0.7% of the daily transfers, right? Uh, daily transactions, I keep this uh, stable, uh, 300,000 uh, transactions, which is actually what um, the count of transactions today, so I don't presume here any like uh, efficiency increments in that. And block subsidy per day uh, in 2028, it's after two halvings, it's going to be 200, 225 bitcoins daily, right? So if transaction fees make up only 5% of the reward, similar to what they are now, quite uh, slightly higher, we would need uh, Bitcoin price to be around $60,000 and fees would be $2 in the first scenario. And of course, uh, if we need to secure more for the daily transfers, of course, uh, either the price or the fee needs to be higher, or actually both of them, right? So, um, like, uh, this is the most crazy, uh, and I, uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen. <laughs> be very crazy. Uh, if uh, only five percent, uh, if there was only like five percent transaction fee like, make, like uh, making the, up the security budget, we would need like a Bitcoin price of $6 million, six million dollars if this much was transferred daily. All right, so what about like uh, if transaction fees actually take over and uh, we have like 75% of the reward in transaction fees? 
then there is like a much uh, less need for high Bitcoin price. And of course, the uh, fees would be like this. So at minimum, it would be like $35. And uh, the Bitcoin price wouldn't actually rise that much. All right, so uh, it's quite fine uh, making these Excel predictions. And uh, how could we achieve like higher transaction fees? I've got some, uh, some proposals here. And since it was full of numbers and charts, I made them in like a meme form. So uh, somebody said like we should reduce the block size. I think it's kind of nice idea. So responsible Bitcoiners uh, maybe could uh, think about that, like smaller block sizes, because uh, then it would it would feel, feel uh, like uh, much easier, and you wouldn't have like this uh, one set per byte uh, transactions. But uh, for everybody else, this seems like a pretty crazy idea. And Luke, uh, who <laughs> proposes this, is uh, actually called crazy for that. So, uh, like the other one is. Uh, this is quite easy. We could make a new metric to measure in history how long it takes for one set transactions uh, to actually get confirmed. And I use one set transactions all the time. I actually use it here uh, at the conference because uh, that's what uh, the green address uh, proposes as like uh, the smallest fee that should actually get uh, confirmed. And it gets confirmed within a few hours. So in the future, it shouldn't be possible to like uh, get uh, one, one set transactions confirmed, uh, at least not uh, within a few hours. Because uh, if that uh, keeps on happening, it means uh, the mempool is uh, not filled that much, and uh, the miners actually don't get um, any reward from that. All right, uh, the third one is uh, like a little bit complicated, so I've split it into two memes. So right now, one of the problems is uh, you don't actually know uh, like how soon the transaction is going to be confirmed. Uh, you either un underpay, and uh, what can happen is that your transaction is stuck in the mempool for like a week or two weeks, or you overpay, and for this single transaction, you pay just too much for, for uh, the transaction, right? So this could be uh, mitigated if we actually did something like uh, block space futures, where you will just uh, auction like uh, uh, your place for the transaction like a week from now, so it will be like a block space futures, right? Everybody's talking about like uh, BACT and CME and CBOE about these Bitcoin futures. I think that's highly irrelevant uh, when it comes to like uh, long-term Bitcoin economics. What's more relevant is security budget and just filling this mempool and uh, like. Block space futures could be like a nice idea for that, and like uh, blackjack and hookers is <laughs> optional. All right, so uh, I hope I uh, gave you something to think about. I'd like to hear, feed hear feedback. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm totally off the rails here, but um, I think it's kind of interesting to see this correlation and just try to explain it. So, uh, if you want to just uh, read some of my analysis, you can uh, follow me like uh, at Crypto Joseph on Twitter or Hackerune. I'm actually going to write this down after I hear the feedback, if it's like not uh, that you're totally dumb and this doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah, so check me out, check out Top Monks. Uh, we are a software development company who do like uh, publishing and analysis and all kind of stuff. We also do like uh, tech angel investments. And check out DBank, this is like a, Bitcoin startup uh, focused on like something like we called uh, pure banking, and we are going to have talks uh, tomorrow in the evening at the institute. So thank you. I'm looking forward to the questions. Okay, thank you, Josef. So any hand raised for a question? I see there in the back. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, this presentation. Uh, you said uh, that uh, what you think uh, is the incentive for the miners not to 51% uh, um, attack uh, the network is uh, that they're, uh, they're making more money by just mining. Uh, I'm, I'm not agree with that 
because I'm thinking that they are not attacking the network because uh, the effect of the attack would just simply kill the network. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, that's true. That's like, uh, like the other measures uh, for securing, securing the network that um, they have to actually uh, pay off the capex over long term. But uh, like, if you take a look at altcoins that were 51% attacked, the miners didn't care that much about killing the network. Because if, it, uh, if, if there is like a huge discrepancy between like what the miners get if they act nicely and uh, what they can get by scamming the exchange, we should expect them to go for that. And we should uh, not rely on them like uh, just playing it nice. Uh, I don't think, I, I'm not sure that uh, this ratio of 0.7% is that uh, number that we are looking for, but there has to be some, some relation of how much gets transferred and uh, by what kind of security budget is it secured by. Like if you were to transfer $10 billion over Bitcoin today, you wouldn't want to like uh, wait for just six confirmations. You would need to wait for Oh, sorry. You you wouldn't uh, you would have to wait for I don't know like half a year because there will be this discrepancy, uh, or actually, the the party receiving the ten billion dollars in Bitcoin would would have to wait for like half a year I think, uh, because otherwise, for the sending party it would be tempting to try to like organize the miners, bribe them, and uh, just try to reorg. So uh, there has to be like some uh, some relation of how much miners get and how much gets transferred on chain. I think that's it's quite clear because uh, otherwise there could there wouldn't have to be any security budget, right? And we will just rely on miners to just uh, act nicely by whatever they get. Good. Okay. We have two more questions. I see first here on the left. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that we, we there, there must be such a, um, um, uh, it can't be too low. I mean, there, there must be some something that the miners earn. But I really didn't understand how you get to the 0.7% because it's, it seems to me like the you just divide it by an arbitrary 144 blocks because that's the day. But why, where's that day come from? So it might be a month. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it could be. It's uh... <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I, I can try to calculate it on a monthly basis, but uh, I think the ratio should be the same because uh, if I can uh, like, uh, calculate, uh, uh, you know, the mining, re mining reward and the daily transfers would be on a monthly basis, let's say. So, like, uh, we can see that uh, over long term this ratio stays the same. Yeah, uh, if you if you the first way you you, you calculate it is is where you actually calculate how much do they earn, and did I understand that right? That this includes the the um, um, the, the fees, the, the fees well. and the yeah. and and the uh, the what's it called the other thing? The subsidy. The, the subsidies too, yeah. right? But that's that's fine. But then you said okay, it must be this way because it's one block in 144, and that I didn't get the logic yeah, there. Yeah, that's, uh, like, <laughs> that's <laughs> like the weakest point of uh, my talk. I guess. Okay. Right. Uh, it's just uh, I don't know. Yeah, I find it kind of interesting. We find this like correlation, which is quite big, and we see that it flattened over the five years when like the price boom and buzz happened, halving happened, and uh, we had like new miners coming. So uh, I don't know like how else I will explain it because uh, as like Health and Carter says, uh, you have to protect against like uh, the reorgs like uh, for like recent blocks, and I think one day is like a good measure of like recent okay. time. Let's say. All right. Okay. Yeah, uh, but I'm good. By I'm trying. I'm going to try to rec recalculate it for uh, like monthly basis and see what comes out. Okay, here is the next one. Thanks for the presentation, I really like it. Um, my question is this, uh, I think it's clear we cannot uh, scale on chain for every single transaction. Uh, I think the second layer, it's 
uh, a fact. But do you think that with the current uh, block space we will have enough uh, space to open all the channels that we need for daily basis? I think if we introduce the uh, like auctioning of future block space, it could, we could actually uh, like increase the probability that everybody gets to open uh, whenever they like because uh, it wouldn't be this race to just uh, be in the next blocks because if you are not in like next couple of blocks you can be you can wait for like a week or two if uh, the fees are high so it would be like a nice like assurance that uh, i don't have to like uh, partake in this race i i will just uh, buy uh, my book space like two weeks from now for some like reasonable price and uh, after that i would have my channel open so i think that, uh, this is going to come as as a part of like maturing of uh, the system that uh, like we uh, kind of give up on this idea that uh, the transactions have to be included in like the next block this is like um, other a narrative that uh, has been quite wrong uh, with Bitcoin that uh, it takes just 10 minutes to send a transaction. Uh, it's completely, it should be completely custom how long the transaction takes. It could take like 10 minutes if you are a trader that's doing some arbitrage or it could take like uh, maybe uh, like uh, you should be able to buy the block space like two weeks for, from now, which would be nice, for example, for settling uh, on-chain futures or something like that. When you need to be sure when it gets settled. Excuse me. Do you see that coming soon? The the block space uh, futures. So the, are the miners miners going to allocate some resources just for? Uh, committing that? Yeah, I, uh, I tried thinking about how this could come about, and I guess miners would have to, might be kind of dangerous because they, they would uh, have to like uh, give some kind of pledge that uh, what gets auctioned gets actually included, <laughs> right? Because, uh, and I don't know how does that happen, maybe with some like multi sig transaction or something, because we don't know who is going uh, to be the single miner who mines that. So I would like uh, just like uh, something that uh, is kind of interesting. Maybe I've seen it somewhere before. I don't know if it's my idea, but I would like to talk to about that with uh, some miners or somebody who's in uh, like uh, futures, how this could come about if you don't know who's actually going to be the party who delivers that. That would be, inter that would be interesting, right? Okay, is there anybody with uh, maybe last question? If no, I will thank to Josef. If you, do, if you don't have anything, what you'd like to add? No, no, just um, uh, feel free to talk to me after the presentation. I'd like uh, to hear any type of feedback. Okay, so Josef will be definitely around, so catch him on maybe later. And uh, here we will continue with the uh, Nick Middleton live stream and definitely we invite you after the, his talk there will be the auction of the gold coin so definitely of Julian Assange so everybody join us. So one more time I ask you for applause for Josef for his presentation. Thank you.